with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening, Mr. Harry Havnunian. Harry is going right. to tell us of his journey and how he started building racing bicycles from scratch in his parents' basement. Led to over 100 national championships, seven World Cups, an hour record, and a silver medal at the Athens Olympics. In the international arena of racing bicycle fabrication, how did this modern day David compete against the Goliaths? If you please welcome Harry. Right, we're on. Are we on? Okay. Kendra, thanks for the introduction. So when I started, I was 18, and like most 18-year-olds, I didn't have a, a clear idea of what it is I wanted to do when I grew up. And besides bikes, my other passion was pizza. So I figured, you know what, I'm going to go to Italy, <clears throat> and I'm going to go to Rome, I'm going to work in a pizza shop, and I'm going to learn how to make pizza. So I'm in the pizza shop making pizza. One day the Pope calls up, and he orders a pizza. So we quickly make the pizza, I get on my bike, I go over to the Vatican, and the Swiss guard tells me, all right, leave it on the counter, and when I get a chance, I'll, I'll take it up to him. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. The Pope ordered a hot pizza, and I'm gonna make sure he gets it. So after we negotiated for a few minutes, he agreed to let me go up, but only if I would give him half the tip when I came down, which I thought was fair. So I go up, I give the Pope his pizza, and we chit chat for a few minutes, and when we're done, I go downstairs, and the guard stops me, and he goes, hey buddy, where's my half of the tip? And I said, oh. <laughs> okay, now for the truthful part of my presentation. So yes, I was 18, um, was racing bicycles. Um, I wanted to build a better bike, um, had no idea. Didn't have the skill set to do it, didn't know what I wanted to build, um, didn't, didn't really know anything about it. All I knew is that I wanted to build bikes. In looking around at what everybody else was doing, like the bigger companies, like they, their commitment was to build bikes to make money. And I knew I was never going to do that. I was never going to have a huge factory. I was never going to make thousands of bikes a day. Um, instead, my commitment was I wanted to build bikes that were going to win races. And like I said, no idea how to get there. I'm 18. I'm just starting engineering at Villanova. And, um, and I'm starting to like, kind of put it together. In building a bike, it's not just fabricating the bike that's the problem. You have to fit the person to the bike. You have to have a design, and you have to be able to build it. We had none of those skill sets. If you go back in the day, the way people were fitted to high-end racing bikes is they would raise the seat until your leg was straight. After that, you'd put your elbow against the seat and your finger would have to be one inch behind the handlebar. And if that didn't happen, you'd slide the seat forward until it, it was. And then in order to verify that that was correct, when you sat on the bike and your hand is on the handlebar, this part of the handlebar would obstruct the front axle. And I'm, I'm looking at this and I go, wow, seriously, this is how you get fitted? It's like, so if you had long fingers, you would get fitted differently than somebody who had shorter fingers? It's like, there, there's something more that, that is just not here. So in doing my research, um, I came across the Italian Cycling Federation who had actually formulas where they would take body measurements, plug and chug these formulas, and it would tell you the dimensions that your bike was supposed to be. So I looked at that. <clears throat> And that didn't really make any sense either because, like, 
all these bikes have different purposes, and you can't design different purpose bikes using the same formulas. Like there's, there's something else that's still not, not being told. And truth of the matter is, they didn't know. They were taking a guess. Um, bike building back then was a combination of art and science, and it was more on the art side than on the science side. Being, you know, hopefully a prospective engineer at some point in my life, I was leaning more towards the, the science side, um, but still had no idea how to get there. Okay, so here I am, 18 years old. I'm racing bikes, engineering student at Villanova. Um, I'm interested in sports car design, so I'm reading a lot about that. And I'm a mechanic at my dad's bike shop, so I'm learning the mechanics of bikes. And, um, and one day we're in engineering class, and they're talking about a four-bar link. And basically it's, it's how locomotives get powered. It converts um, you know, angular or directional motion into rotational motion. And I'm sitting back and I'm looking and I'm like, you know what, that's what happens on a bike. It's a four-bar link. Because your, your thigh, that's one link, two, your foot is the third, and the crank arm is the fourth. And you're converting your legs going up and down into rotation on the crank. So I start looking at these formulas, <clears throat> and you can vary the length of all these pieces and, and adjust the horsepower and the speed. And I'm like, all right, we're finally getting somewhere. This, this is making sense. Now, with a bike and a rider, you can't obviously adjust your leg length, but you can adjust where the cleat on the bottom of your shoe is, which effectively adjusts your foot length. And the crank arms come in different lengths. So by adjusting those two uh, you know, variables, we can now tailor horsepower and speed on a bike. And I'm like, all right, this is good, because now I, I have an idea of how to get somebody fitted on a bike. So that took care of how you sit on a bike, because you would raise the seat and then move it forward and backward until your knee had a specific relationship to the crank. And, and that would be dependent on what you're doing with the bike. Do you need speed or do you need power? So we would fit people according to that. And then in terms of how long the bike is this way, also, there were formulas, but the formulas didn't take into account. Are you 18 years old and you can lean over and breathe you know, like a machine? Or are you 40 and you need to sit more upright with your arms a little further apart so you can get some air in your chest? So I figured formulas weren't going to work. And the only way we're going to get somebody fitted to a bike is they need to come into our shop. We get them on their existing bike, ask them what's working and what isn't. What do you intend to do with this bike? And after interviewing them, we would literally design a bike specifically for their, their dimensions and for their use. So every bike we build is unique. And you can have the same size person, but for two different events, they would get a bike that is fitted differently. Um, it seemed like a lot of trouble, but it fit really well into our philosophy which is, we're gonna build bikes that are gonna win races. Um, also in engineering class, um, one day we were talking about how much thread engagement do you need when a nut threads onto a bolt? Because if the nut is this long, it's gonna be heavier than if it's this long. But do you need this much or do you need this much? So they had all these formulas that would tell you what you would need. All right, so why is that important? Because in physics class, we learned F equals MA. For a given force, you can accelerate quicker if the bike is lighter. So we want to make the bike as light as we can get it without it being dangerous. Another one of our philosophies, you can't win a race if you don't finish. So we didn't want anything that was flimsy or was going to be any, any chance of a failure. Plus, we don't want people to get hurt, plain and simple. We want them to come back and buy another bike. So in learning what the minimum thread engagement was, 
it allowed us to shave down the nuts and the bolts and, and you save a couple grams here and a couple grams there. And <clears throat> we, we realized we weren't going to make a big difference in terms of we're not going to discover a new bike, a new technique, a new anything. But in calculus class, I learned that if you have a bunch of small changes, it adds up to a difference. And that's what we wanted to do with the bike. Let's save two grams on this bolt. Let's save five grams here. Let's save 15 over there. And the next thing you know, we're saving a pound. Well, the whole bike only weighs 20 back then. So if we could take out a pound, that's huge. Um, in studying sports car design, um, I was reading about polar moments of inertia. It's a fancy word, but what it really means is if you move weight towards the center between the wheels, you reduce that polar moment of inertia. And that's why Ferrari and Lotus are mid-engine cars. When they steer, there's less, less energy that's needed to change the direction. So we looked at the bike and we figured, okay, so what could we do to move mass towards the center without doing something like ridiculous or stupid? Like you want to maintain a certain position, but there were certain things that we could do. One of which was we moved the gear levers down. On a lot of bikes back then, the shift levers were up really high. Well, first off, it's inconvenient for them to be that high. This is a more natural position because when you're on the bar, your hand naturally falls there. The other thing we looked at were the water bottles. Now, this bike only has one, but on bikes that had two, we moved this bottle down as low as we could get it and then moved this one as close to that one as we could so that there was this bike. A minimal amount of room between the two bottles. And what that did was it moved mass towards the center of the bike and also it moved it lower into the bike. Because another thing I read in sports car design, they're low to the ground so they handle better. In designing our bikes we kind of did the same thing by moving those components and we also lowered the crank set to the absolute minimum that was legally allowed so that you could race the bike. And what that did was it lowered the rider on the bike. Now that was significant because riders are, are heavy compared to the weight of the bike. So all of a sudden it's like, you know, these pieces are starting to come together. It's like we have a design, it's making sense, we, we can build a different bike for a different purpose um, and have like, these very specific, highly efficient machines that the bigger companies can't produce. Because as a small builder, the only way we're going to make it is if we do something totally innovative or we do something that they don't want to do or they're not able to do. So that was our, our key for what we were looking to do. Another thing we did was we looked at the bikes and we go, you know what, there's no reason that the rear brake has to be over here, which is where everybody else does it. So we moved the brake in here. All right, so what did that do for us? It moved mass towards the center. Um, the cable could now be two inches shorter because it didn't have to go back as far. So you save a little bit of weight, another couple grams. The cable was shorter, so it was more efficient because brake cables tend to stretch when they're under load. So now you're, you were getting a good response out of your rear brake that you weren't getting before. Um, we were mechanics. Plenty of times you lean out of a car window during a race to make an adjustment on a bike. By putting the brake on the inside, now all your adjustments are on one side of the bike. It's really difficult when a bike is moving to have to lean out of a window and then lean around the bike to make an adjustment. So now you can be on one side and hit everything. Another thing that happened by putting the brake in that position and, and this is pretty technical, and if I lose you, let me know. The rim of a bike is V-shaped. So where the tire is, it's a little bit wider than at the bottom, at this end. When your brake is over here and it hits the rim, as the rim is rotating, it, it forces the brake down the rim. The exact opposite happens when the brake is here. The brake comes up the rim. 
That's important because when the pads come up, the rim is a little bit wider, so it's a self-energizing brake. When it's on the traditional side, when you put the brake on, as soon as it grabs, it gets easier, so you have to give it another little squeeze. And a lot of times you misjudge that second squeeze, lock up the wheel, and then that's it, you're done. So all of a sudden we had a design that was, that was like coming together. So I built the first bike, this one, for myself. This is serial number one. Um, we've made just over 2,000 bikes in our career, and it all started with this baby. Built it for myself, rode it, it was a great bike. Lent it to a friend of mine, he took first place at the state championships. Um, but the real break occurred on bike number two. And that went to my brother, my brother Frank. And my brother was much faster on a bike than I was. And I learned early on, it's like I'm only so fast on a bike, I'm only going to be able to push my designs so far. So I have to rely on people who are better than me on a bike to push them, give me the feedback so that we can design and make an improvement on the next one. So my brother, um, barrel chested guy, 25 and a half inch thighs, um, he was the equivalent of like a 454 engine with a you know, four barrel carburetor that's wide open. Uh, if he could breathe, he'll go fast. Um, unlike the analogy with the car motor, uh, my brother didn't have a throttle. He had an off and an on switch. He was great at time trialing. You go for 25 miles, you time it, and compare it to everybody else. And, um, and, and he was really very good, took second place at the state championships. And because of his successes on the bikes, other guys in our local club were interested and they would start coming around and, and buying my bikes. And that worked out great until we had this guy, Ian Jones, who was a member of the US national team. He was going to school at Penn, was checking out the local racing scene, ended up in our shop, and he wanted to get a bike. The problem was he was sponsored by a bike company. No problem, uh, we got the paint and we painted our bike to look like their bike. <laughs> kind of like what they do with uh, athlete sneakers today. Um, so he's over in Europe, he's in Austria, racing with the team, and he's doing really well. And one day, after a, a stage race, the mechanic puts his bike up on the roof of the car, and he's distracted and he forgets to lock it down. So they're, they're coming back to their hotel room, driving through the mountains, twisty, turny roads, and all of a sudden they hear this, and they look out the rear view mirror, and here's Ian's bike tumbling end over end, and there's pieces flying off, and the wheels are breaking, and the handlebar is breaking, and he's, he's like crushed. He didn't have a spare bike. Um, he gets back to the hotel room, they put a pair of wheels on it, a new handlebar, a new seat, uh, the mechanic gets everything, you know, as best he can. Ian gets on the bike, goes down the road, takes his hands off the handlebar, and the bike tracks perfectly straight. Goes back to his hotel room, sends me a postcard, which I still have, and he said, the bike sprints really well. Uh, we had an issue today. Build me two more. Um, that was a defining moment in our career. Um, I mean, him coming in was a defining moment, but that particular point was really a defining moment. And after that, it just, it exploded. Um, he was doing really well. Other members on the team, as they needed bikes, would come in. Um, if they didn't have a bike sponsor, they could put our, our name and logo and decals, and, uh, and it was really cool. I mean, here I am in my, my parents' basement, um, you know, building bikes up. It, uh, it, it was something that totally, it changed my life and, and I was saying earlier that I feel very privileged to know at such a young age what it is I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I mean, to figure that I could make a living doing something that I would do for nothing and feel privileged doing um, was really special. 
So that's, that's kind of how we came up with our design and how we fitted people. Um, but the problem now is, um, if you back up, it's like, okay, so we had a design and pretty sure we have a way to fit people, but I have never had a torch in my hand in my life. I have no idea how to braze, how to put a bike together. So I went back to my junior high school, my metal shop teacher, Jim Doyle, and told him what I wanted to do. And he told me to come in after classes and he would teach me how to braze as best as he knew. Um, so he, he kind of pointed me in a direction and I, I learned how to braise up to a point, um, but there is no substitute like hours and hours and hours of doing something. Part of our design centers around a lot of technical issues. Um, most race bikes during the day were brass brazed. And we decided we didn't want to go there. We want a silver braze. And silver brazing was important because it's a lower temperature process and you can do it faster, which means ultimately there's less calories of heat going into the frame. Why is that important? Because all the tubing that bikes are made from are heat treated. And the longer you keep them at temperature, the weaker they become which is another thing that made our bikes really good at racing because we silver brazed them, they were done quickly, and the frames were much stronger than what was out there. It also allowed us to use lighter gauge tubing, um, which then saved you weight and made the bike even lighter and more competitive. So how do you build a bike? Um, you start off with mitering tubes. And mitering is a process where we put, and I'll, I'll pass this around so you can see it, but we put a circular cut on the end of a tube so that this tube butts up perfectly with the next tube. And when they fit that close, it's easy to join them. Now, Back in the day, there weren't a lot of reliable welding processes that worked on very thin gauge tubing. So something known as a lug was used and the tubes slide into the lug and then we would silver braze them. So let me get this started and you guys can look at a piece of a bike. So those, those two pieces, when they're put together, it, it's this lug right here. So it's the head tube and the top tube. So it's this. So when we started, apart from not having any idea of what we were doing, I had no money, which makes it really difficult to buy the tools and the machinery that you need to do what we needed to do. But there's a substitute for not having money. And the substitute is <clears throat> hours and hours and hours. So what we did was uh, I went down to Sears Roebuck in Upper Darby and I bought a, uh, a half round, round file. I bought like a couple of different ones, different sizes. And I would get that tube and I made wooden blocks to hold them. I'd clamp it in a vise and I would start filing and filing and then I'd get the other tube and fit it and see where it was hitting and where I had to move and cut more out. And it would take a couple hours to put in a very accurate miter. Um, and the problem wasn't even putting in the first miter at this end. The problem is now you got to put a miter at this end that's in phase, meaning when you slide the tubes in, this tube and this tube are going to be parallel. You don't want them like, you know, skewed. And then you also had to get the correct angle and you had to get the right distance measured center to center. So if this one took two hours, that miter took like eight hours. And that's one tube. And you still have two more. So mitering took a lot of time. Um, the first 12 bikes that we built all got hand miters. 
we saved every penny from the 12 bikes, and I went out and bought my first machine, which was a totally destroyed, beat up lathe that needed a lot of work. Um, the lathe I bought was so old, it, it's actually kind of like the lathes that are upstairs that ran off of a central belt that went through, a, or a central shaft, and then belts came down to power the machines. Well, I didn't have a central shaft running through my house, so I had to weld up a framework with a motor and use V-belts and leather belts and pulleys, and, but now I had a machine that put miters in. So now, on every frame, I was saving 15 to 20 hours of labor. Um, I'm still nowhere near the point that I'm gonna make money doing this, but at least now I can get it done easier, quicker, um, and it allowed us to develop a philosophy. And what I did was I ranked every process that had to get built on a frame. And every time we had money, I would get a machine or make a fixture that would take care of the next item on the list so that we could save time. Because like this frame, that was 200 hours of labor. That's a lot of labor to put into something. Um, today, um, building frames that are much nicer than that one, um, we put in maybe 40 hours of labor, which is still a lot to put into something, um, but it's one-fifth and it's better today. So in getting back to how frames are built, you miter the tubes, you slip them into the lugged socket, it then gets silver brazed, um, and all that's done in a fixture to hold everything straight. Um, and then after that's done, you go in with little files and you clean up all the brazing so that it looks nice. You thin out the lugs because if the lug is much thicker than the tube, and the tube is very thin, which you'll see as that piece comes around, the tubes are at the ends like seven-tenths of a millimeter. You're talking 28 thousandths of an inch, pretty thin. So you want to taper the lug so that <clears throat> you don't get a stress crack, which is more time. You've got to sit there and file it or get a belt sander and sand it down. And um, you know, I, I did a lot of them myself until uh, Dennis, um, who's been with me now for 34 or 5 years, something like that, um, did all my metal, does, still does, all my metal work. And he's the best guy in the business for doing it. And if you want to witness some of his handiwork, look at this bike. Um, that one's made with a different process. Okay, there's no lug that the tubes fit into. On that one, you miter the tubes, put them next to each other, and then you do something known as fillet braze, where you have a, a buildup of material, you know, the brazing rod, you build it up, and then Dennis goes in and anything that doesn't look like a bike, he files it off and smooths it out, and look at that thing, it is perfect. There's not a mark, there's not a ridge, there's nothing. It's, it's as good as they come. The other way you build bikes is um, miter the tubes, jig them up, and then there's a process known as TIG welding. T-I-G stands for tungsten inert gas. It's an electric process. The electrode is made out of tungsten because it withstands the high heat. The inert gas is argon because it's non-reactive. When you weld titanium, which is what this bike is, titanium is non-reactive until you get it up to its welding temperature. And then it reacts violently with oxygen and nitrogen, which is pretty much everything that's in the air. So you have to shield it from those gases. So the welding torch, so if you can imagine, that's the electrode. When you strike an arc, there's gas that goes around and pushes out the oxygen and nitrogen. Well, the problem is, is that inside the tube, it is still at the welding temperature, and there's still oxygen and nitrogen in there. So we came up with a bunch of plugs, and we, we would put argon gas into the frame from here. And then there's a series of holes of diminishing size that run through the frame so that the gas tends to flow in a particular direction. 
our welding process follows that direction. So the gas comes in here, we weld the bottom first, which forces the gas up this way. We weld this joint, and then that joint, and then this one, because that's the path that the gas is following. And of course, up here, it's all sealed off so that the gas has to go that way. And then there's holes that go down here, holes that go down this way, and at that point, you could take a choice of where you want to go first, and, and they get welded up. Another way um, of putting bikes together is like this bike. Now, back in 1991, we took a contract with a French company, and they developed a technology where bike frames were glued together. So they were made out of metal and eventually carbon, and they were glued. They needed somebody to do their repair work, and, and that job fell on us, because we were a small builder, very technical, but we had the ability to make the jigs and fixtures needed to get that job done. So we became their, their service center for North America, South America, actually South and Central America, Canada. And, and Canada, thank you. He would know because he did a lot of the repairs, most of them. So we were getting 50, 60 bikes a week um, that broke, that were getting shipped into us. And we had to make extra jigs and fixtures, but we were able to get all the work done. So at one point, Dennis and I go out for a ride after work with the guys, and we go to a, uh, I forget, I think someplace in the city, a restaurant, bar, and Dennis and I are sitting at the, at the bar, and we're eating dinner, and we're talking about all these bonded bikes that, that fall apart. So um, we decided, you know what, I, I think we could do a better job, because we see all the mistakes that they're making. So we then, we go out and we contact all the other little companies that are making glued bikes. And we tell them, hey, if you need somebody to do your repairs, we can do it, because we do them all for Vitas, which is the French company. And we have all the fixtures already, so we can take care of that. Well, we really didn't care to do their repair work. The only reason we wanted to do it is we wanted to see what they were doing. And the best way for that to happen is when they come apart, you can look inside and you could measure the dimensions, the number of square inches of contact area, um, tolerances between various pieces, and, and try to get a sense of like, what are they doing wrong that's making these bikes fail? So, um, you know, in talking with people, they would look at our glued frame and they'd go, wow, that's pretty cool. How long did it take for you to design that? And I go, two beers. And they go, wow, two years, that's pretty good. I, no, two beers. Dennis and I were sitting at a bar and over two beers, we sketched out the design on the little cocktail napkins. And, uh, and that was the result. So that, that's a frame that's glued together. If you look at the lugs, you'll notice that they're bigger than those lugs. And, and that's because when you glue a frame together, the adhesive doesn't have the strength that brazing has. So you need more square inches of contact. So the lugs got, got bigger. Now, this was an interesting design for us because one of the reasons that the French company had failures was galvanic corrosion. One of the things I learned in chemistry class when I was in Villanova. And simply put, galvanic corrosion is what allows a battery to work. You put two dissimilar materials next to each other. You put a, a material that's a pathway for the electrons and you have a battery, but you also have corrosion. And that's why their frames were failing, because they were putting carbon fiber tubes next to aluminum lugs. And if you look at the electronegativities, it was like the perfect scenario for failure. So when we designed our frame, we went with stainless steel lugs, which were a little bit heavier, but you can't finish the race if your bike falls apart. So carrying a little bit of extra weight was not a bad thing. And what this design also allowed us to do, we didn't have to use carbon fiber tubing. 
we could glue any material as long as it fit our lugs. So we started looking around and we went to a company in Sandy, Utah and, and we had a whole series of carbon fiber tubes made to our specification. Now the interesting thing about carbon fiber is that this is what's known as an anisotropic material. It's like wood. There's a fiber to it and it has more strength in one direction than another. By orienting the angle of the fibers and how many layers, you could tailor the strength of this product. So when we designed this frame, we looked at, you know, like what are we trying to accomplish here with this bike that we couldn't do with a metal bike? Well, when you're riding a bike, you pull on the handlebars when you sprint or climb a hill. That puts this tube and this tube in torsion. So we wanted to make these two tubes stiff in torsion. This tube, when you pedal hard, goes into bending. It wants to get pushed side to side and, and get bent. So we made that tube stiff in bending by orienting the fibers. So uh, essentially what we did was we used one material, but we gave it a lot of different properties. So here's a piece of carbon tubing. You can see how light it is. Also what this project allowed us to do was we didn't have to use carbon fiber tubing. Like I said, anything that would glue between the lugs, we could use. So about this time, there were a bunch of classified materials that were developed um, for the space race, for the <clears throat> for defense that our government no longer had a use for. The Cold War was, was over, these materials were already in the process of being built, and they needed to find alternative uses for them. So a company that made a product called Metal Matrix Composite contacted us and they said, if you give us the dimensions you need for tubing, um, we can get a government grant for you to get these tubes made. Because dyes have to get made, they have to fit into a press, it's an involved process. So we gave them our dimensions and they made up a set of, uh, a bunch of sets of tubes that we could then glue into a frame. So we built a couple up, we did our testing, the stuff was a winner. Very light, very strong. And what it is, it's, it's an aluminum tube, but they powder the aluminum, they add silicon carbide, which is a whisker, mix it up, it goes into an autoclave, and they put it under pressure and heat and fuse it back into a solid. Now, this material is unweldable, but you can glue it into bike frames. So that's what we did. Now, because this was a military classified material, they would only sell it to us in 28 inch lengths because you couldn't do anything with that. Like it came in pieces that were 17 feet long, but if you had a 17 foot piece, you could use it for a hydraulic line in, in a jet fighter or there were other applications. So short pieces, that's all they would sell us. So feel the weight of that one. The frame that we built with that material, see they only made three, these three tubes that would fit our lugs. So for back here, we used carbon fiber. For this, we used titanium. And each material was intelligently chosen to be in a specific location depending on, on its strength and what you needed. So the material science uh, department head at Penn catches wind of our bike and he goes, can I have one to look at? I just want to study it. Sure. So we, we got him a bike. He looked at it. He wanted some of the material. He took uh, electron pictures of the grain structure and he was intrigued with the material, never saw it. He wrote an entire book about our bike and it was the book that you now study from if you go to Penn and you do material science. It's based on our bike and why each material was chosen and used in a certain location. Um, yeah, his name was Charles McMahon and he, he actually passed away this year. 
Um, really good guy, very smart, and uh, obviously has good taste in bikes. <coughs> Um, so th that's the two ways that bikes get built, or three ways. Um, I'm trying to think where else I can go with this. So a couple years ago, um, I did a vintage bike race in Tuscany. And to do the event, you have to have a 1980 or older race bike. Um, so we had one in our basement, took it out, got it all fixed up, renovated, repainted, go over and did the event. It's the same course that they do the, uh, but the, the car race, the Mila Miglia, I think it's called. Or, yeah, it's, it's part of the same course. Um, it goes through the mountains in Tuscany, beautiful. And, and actually there were a lot of old cars that, that followed the, the racers. 4,000 people did this event, all on vintage bikes. So when I got back to the shop, we designed a series of brand new vintage race bikes. Sounds like a contradiction, but what we did was we found old parts that were brand new, uh, old tubing that was brand new, a lot of it we had. Um, we followed the old design and we built vintage race bikes. This orange one being one of them. Um, that's a 1970s style French racing bike. Um, absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. Dennis did, you know, fabulous metal work, the colors, the paint, everything on it's perfect. Um, in trying to keep with our trademark of the rear brake being on the inside of the frame, um, back in the 1970s, they had a different braking system that, that utilized two cables, and it was called a center pull brake. And because this bike was French, we figured the French solution to a simple problem would have to be a very complicated answer. <clears throat> so we designed this braking system, and, and it truly fits the uh, criteria. Shimano, which is um, the big parts supply company, um, if anybody out there is a bike rider, um, chances are you have Shimano parts. Shimano heard of our brand new vintage bike project and commissioned us to build this maroon and yellow colored bike. That's a 19, like late 70s, early 80s race bike with all Shimano first generation componentry. So they wanted us to build that bike uh, for their museum, which is at their headquarters in Irvine, California. So we finished the bike up, it got painted, we contacted Shimano, and we, uh, we set up a delivery date for March of 2020. So we still have the bike. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the, the way industry is right now, Shimano has bigger issues than getting this bike in their museum. So we'll hold on to it until things get straightened out. Um, so that's kind of, I'm not going to say that's it for my talk. I mean, I do have more, and I will certainly go there. Um, but I figured next I would maybe get into a few stories. Um, you know, after building racing bikes for close to 50 years and dealing with a lot of characters and people who are very committed and focused um, in their pursuit of, of winning, um, you, you do tend to accumulate some stories. So I don't know if anybody noticed all the photographs on the tables over here when you came in. Um, there's one photograph, it's a black and white, and it's um, another one of our defining moments where our bikes came in first and second place at the national championships that year. Unheard of. I don't think we built 25 bikes at that point. And to win first and second at a championship was, it was just unheard of. Um, the guy on the right-hand side in the picture, um, Earl Page, he's not far from here, um, had a broken collarbone when he raced, and he still came in second. Um, just to give you kind of like the, the type of people that we deal with, it's just very focused and, uh, and really good at what they do. But in the picture, you can actually see his collarbone, you know, st sticking through the shirt. He, would, uh, he told us the story where 
if he would just stay off his bike for a month, it would have meshed and he would have been fine. But he told his doctor, he's like, uh, nah. he goes, I got nationals coming up in a month. There's no way I'm not going to be competing. So, uh, uh, you know, do whatever you can do. And, and they couldn't really do much. They put him in a sling. And the problem was that he would put the sling on and then he would go to sleep and then he would turn over and it would pop out. So his wife used to have to sit on his shoulder every morning to pull it back and then pop the bone in place. Um, it's painful for me to just tell you the story. <laughs> but, um, and, and Paige is a, a, another interesting character. Um, in his whole career, he won 13 national titles on our bikes. He set a uh, transcontinental record, coast to coast, um, did it in nine days. Um, amazing, amazing athlete. And the way he came to us was he went to another frame builder and he wanted to get a bike. And this was a guy that was a little more established than we were, so he ended up there first. He goes in, talks to the guy, and tells him what he wants to do, and, and the guy literally spends five minutes with a tremendous attitude telling him how good his bikes are. And, and then Paige asks him, he goes, uh, you know, I'm also thinking about going down to uh, Drexel Hill, and there was a builder down there. And he said, and then the guy spent 55 minutes telling me what a screw up you were everything I do wrong and he just went into this huge thing so when he left the guy's shop he of course comes down to see me and he later tells me the story he goes one of two scenarios just happened he goes either you really are a big screw-up and if you're as big a screw-up as he said you were I had to come down and meet you <laughs> or you build a really good bike and he's afraid of you and I needed to figure out which was which so he comes down, wants to know about the bikes. We talk for probably an hour and a half, two hours. And when we were done, he goes, oh, what do you think of such and such as bikes? And all I remembered, like in a flash, was my grandmother telling me as a kid, if you don't have something good to say about anybody, don't dwell on the negative. So I said, you know, Paige, if, if I didn't build bikes, I said, I would probably buy one of his. I said, I think he makes a pretty good bike. And then Paige goes, all right, make me two of them. And I was like taken back. It's like, really? It's like, what was that all about? And he said, you didn't badmouth them. So there was a, there was a lesson to learn there. Um, what other stories can I tell you? What's that? Primary, the primary metal you so currently, because I can't get a welder, we build lugged steel vintage race bikes. So our industry has shifted away from steel, to answer your question, into carbon fiber. We can't build carbon fiber. I mean, we can, it's just there's a lot of uh, OSHA regulations and, and things that I just don't want to get involved in at this right. point. So what we did was we started a... Uh, another bike company called Noon Bicycles. So it's like have Noonian, but it's just Noon. And that's what these are. We don't build them, but we design them because we have a complete design studio, which is essentially what all our custom bikes are because each one's custom made, custom designed. So we designed um, a carbon fiber road bike and a carbon fiber track bike. They made prototypes, they came back, we had them tested. Um, the track bike we had sent out to Colorado Springs to the Olympic Training Center and we had various athletes put it through its paces and, and get our results. And when we were just about ready to pull the trigger and get this project like really going, um, Trump puts a 30% tariff on imported product. Now, you can debate the effectiveness of what he did, but in our world what just happened was the cost of inventory went up 30%. Well, everybody's inventory goes up 30%, so you're still pretty even. The difference is companies like 
Trek and Specialized sell thousands of bikes, and they're not going to get stuck with inventory they paid 30% too much for, because they could sell it quicker than we can. So it, even the minimum orders would have been enough for three or four years of our distribution. So I figured, you know what, we're going to put this project on hold. Did that, and then of course the world's problems went from bad to worse, and it's still on hold, and it's probably going to stay there for a while. But um, this is actually a state-of-the-art race bike. As it stands, it's illegal to race because it's too light. That's a, a bike that's coming in under 13 pounds, and it's, it's sturdy. And in order for that bike to be raced, we'd have to add a couple ounces, which we would do by putting more aerodynamic wheels. So they're deeper this way, which adds weight, uh, but then it would be of, of regulation weight, so it would be fine. Um, one of our stories. My brother wins second place at the time trial championships. After the race, his bike is in the car, the front wheel is off, so the, the two fork blades are, are just like laying on the side exposed. Somebody comes by and, and gives him two beers, one for him, one for me, for celebrating his second place. Well, that's great, except we didn't have an opener to get the caps off. So we're looking around on his bike and like, you know, is there some place on the bike we could leverage this in and pop the cap off? And I'm looking at the forks and I go, you know, if those ends just had a little notch cut in them, it would pop the cap off. So when we get back to the shop, I have those pieces because we make custom bikes and I put one in a vise and filed the little notch in it, drilled the hole for a key ring. I, we have a stamp that has our HH logo on it and I stamped that into the metal. And I made 10 of them that night. <clears throat> Monday morning, I took them to the chrome plater and got them plated up and they looked beautiful, looked like jewelry. Next weekend, we go to a bike race. Go up to some of my buddies and I go, hey, check this out. Look, we made this up last weekend, bottle cap opener. And they looked at it and they go, yeah, I'll take one. Sold all 10 at the next race. So I didn't have any more of the parts, so I ordered more of them. Next time I made up 50, instantly sold. Made 100, instantly sold. It got to the point where we bought all of those pieces that were in the country. And the only way we could get more was to order them direct from Italy from the company that produced them, a company called Campagnolo, which um, also has roots in, in car production. They, they make the wheels and uh, engine blocks for Ferrari. So we go to Campagnolo. And you know, we're thinking like, geez, I think we could sell a bunch of these things. So we order 10,000 of them. And, and the guys at Camp Agnola look at us and they go, do you realize that's three months of our production of that part? I'm like, give us a price. And so they, they gave us a number, we ordered them. Uh, a couple months later, they show up. About a month after that, we get a phone call from the largest producer of bicycles in the United States. He can't get dropouts for his bikes because <laughs> we have them all. And in order for him to get into the queue for production with Campagnolo, it's gonna be another couple months. And, and he wants to get his bikes built. So he goes, I'll give you a dollar more than you paid for them. And I go, John, I'll tell you what. I said, you know what we do with these dropouts? He goes, no idea. I said, we make these key ring bottle openers. They look like jewelry, they're beautiful. I said, you have shops all over the country that sell your bikes. I said, I'll sell you one key ring bottle opener for every pair of dropouts that you need. And I said, and I don't want a dollar more. I'll sell them to you for what I paid for. Just buy the key ring bottle openers. And he goes, I'm not doing that. I said, fine, don't do it. I said, I could sell every one. I said, don't lose track of who's doing who the favor here. Anyway, he wouldn't buy them. Um, so I don't know what he did for his bikes, but we had a lot of happy people that had key ring bottle openers. <laughs> and I actually, I have one that we can pass around. Um, so, so this is the actual piece 
that the, the front wheel clips into. There we go. Bobbled it. All right, what other stories can I tell? Uh, how about Olympic stories? So uh, we had five bikes racing at the Athens Olympics. Um, one American guy and two Canadians and two Norwegians. The Canadians and the Norwegians were racing on our tandems. Um, tandem racing is not a, a sport in the United States uh, for reasons of liability. The, uh, the US committee doesn't want to get involved with it. They think it's too dangerous, but in Europe it's huge. Um, so all our racing tandems get shipped out overseas. <clears throat> so I, I go to the Olympics and uh, as soon as I get there, I call up the mechanic for the US team and I said, listen, uh, I said, you know, you got some of our bikes over there racing. I said, if you have any questions or issues, uh, you know, you got my cell number, give me a call and uh, I'll be more than happy to come down and help. And he goes, can't do that. I said, why is that? And he goes, because uh, you're not certified to repair the bikes. I'm like, really? I said, explain this to me. I said, I can design the bike, I can build the bike, I can hang the parts on the bike and ship it to you, but if there's a problem, I can't fix it. And he goes, that's right. <laughs> and it's another issue of liability. I'm not a certified mechanic from the Olympic Committee, so I can't, I mean, I could be. All I gotta do is pay the fee and take the class, or maybe take the fee and teach the class. Um, but that's the rule, and I'm like, all right, well, you got my number if you need somebody to you know, point you in a direction. Fortunately, we didn't have any issues, um, so I didn't have to go down. Another Olympic story. Um, there are two rules in the Olympic rule book because of us. On some of our tandems, on the front forks, we spelled out Havnunian, big letters, going right down the, the side of the fork. And on the tandem racing bikes, the forks are about that wide. And have Nunian, like it just fit perfectly on the length. And we used a reflectorized material for the decals. And my thought was really simple. They were gonna race indoors. The lighting is quartz lighting. And quartz lighting reacts really well with reflective materials. And I figured as these bikes were going around in a circle at the velodrome, you could really see our name, it's gonna like pop. So what I didn't take into account is that track racing, the difference between first place and second place is usually about that much. And it always comes down to a photo finish. So when our bikes were coming to the finish line and they snapped the picture, because the decals were reflective, it was kind of like flashing the camera like a flash right into the camera, and you couldn't see anything. It was just a big flash. So they, they put tape over our decals and uh, added a line in the rule book that you could not use reflective material on a bike. <laughs> Guilty. Um, the other thing we did that got us a mention in the rule book is um, one of the bikes we had there was a tricycle, a racing tricycle made out of titanium very specific use bike, very exotic. And when we get into something new, we do a bunch of research, we look at all the problems, we come up with what we think are unique solutions. And when we looked at racing tricycles, um, I read through like 79 pages in the rule book about what a racing tricycle should be. And it only said in the rule book that it has to have two working handbrakes. Well, everybody puts two brakes on the front wheel. Now, I don't know how many of you as a kid rode your bike and jammed on the front brake. The bike flips over. So do the racing tricycles, except they do it easier because they have two brakes on the front wheel. And when you race a bike, the idea is you want to stay fast as long as possible and you nail the brakes going into a corner so that you're going fast you know, for a longer period of time. And a lot of times when they would do that, they'd flip. So we made a bike that had dual inboard rear disc brakes. 
So now this bike had three wheel braking, so they could wait much longer before they nailed the brakes, stayed faster longer. The other thing we did was we looked at how trikes pedal. And on every tricycle, only one rear wheel drives the bike. And when you pedal really hard, the bike, it, it gets torqued and you have to correct with the steering. So effectively, your bike is going crooked down the road. And we figured, you know what, if we had two wheels driving the bike, um, it would take care of that problem. And it would also take care of the problem of when you sprint on a tricycle and you're pulling on the handlebars, the wheels come off the ground in the back. Like one wheel comes up and then the other wheel comes up and so forth. Well, when the drive wheel comes up, you can't pedal. So we came up with a, a limited slip differential that we machined up, um, put it on the trike, and as long as one rear wheel was touching the ground, you could pedal. And at the Olympics, this guy just walked away from everybody. He ended up taking second place. The guy that took third place lodged a protest, said the drive system was illegal. Well, according to the 79 pages I read, it wasn't. It didn't store energy, which is the big concern. Um, it was just a more efficient system. Um, so there was a line in the rule book about that specific drivetrain and that it's legal to race on it. The guy who took second place calls me after the Olympics. Um, and he thanks us for the job we did building his bike. And, and he tells me, he goes, you know, I, I want to send you my jersey. And it's, it's in a frame over there. You can check it out. And I, I got very emotional and I teared up. And, uh, and I said, God, Stu, I said, you know, there's, there's two things that are coming to mind hearing that. And he goes, what's that? I said, well, the first is, you know, if I, if I won a medal at the Olympics, Nobody would get my shirt. So I thank you. I really appreciate it. And he goes, what's the second thing? I go, did you wash it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What else can we talk about? <clears throat> um, I don't know. That might be enough for today. Question. What kind of price range? That's a good question. Um, there's no set price because there's no set bike. Everyone is unique and different. Um, but I could tell you a good average is uh, 10 to 14,000, like in that range. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will be here afterwards. If there's more questions, people can come up and, uh, and you know, ask. But before I finish, there's a few things that I do want to talk about. And one is, um, I am truly grateful for my God-given talent that has allowed me to do exactly what I do. And, um, and to me, it's very special. I'm also appreciative for the support of my friends and my family and my fiance, Lauren. Um, I'm grateful for the day Dennis walked through the door of my shop and got a job with me. Um, also with uh, Drayton uh, and Lee Farrell, two of the like best mechanics that have ever been around. They can hang bikes on a park on a bike and make it sing like nobody else. Um, truly part of the success. Um, and the other thing I'm grateful for is compound interest. <laughs> Thank you.